Hello, Tanya Laird here, and welcome to part one of lecture 17 of ENGR 2301 Engineering Statics. This will be la the last regular lecture in this uh, lecture series, although after the semester ends I might go and add up a couple more extra videos to this if I feel so inclined, but in terms of the regular uh, summer 2018 term, this will be uh, the last lecture of the semester. Okay, so today I want to look at um, the parallel axis theorem, which is a final tool in our toolkit in order to calculate the uh, moments of inertia of uh, cross sections, and in particular the moments of inertia of the cross sections of beams. So, uh, moment of inertia. Let's do a bit of review. Moment of inertia. And of course we're talking about uh, area moment of inertia, as we saw in lecture 16. And in the previous lecture we saw a few things. One, we saw how to calculate the moment of inertia by integration for a continuous, a single uh, continuous shape. Or maybe I should say previously, we saw two things. One, how to calculate I uh, for a single continuous shape or something made up of simple parts that you can just add together. Second, uh, we also saw that the coordinate axis you choose is going to have an immense impact on the moment of inertia, uh, or the location that you take the moment of inertia about matters. And probably instead of location, I should say axis. You take the moment of inertia about matters. And what I mean by axis in this case is not just whether you take it in the x or y, although that, that of course does matter for a shape, but for example, if you have a generic rigid body here, a generic rigid body with a center of, or maybe a centroid there, even looking just at i axis, if you have one i, if you take i about this axis, maybe i x one, uh, then i, another i i x two here, another i x three here, etc the i will vary depending on which axis you choose. There is a very different, um, <clears throat> though you'll produce very different values depending on what axis you choose. And where we saw this last time was, we, one example we looked at uh, in part two of lecture 16 was when we looked at the moment of inertia of a rectangle. And so we had a rectangular section, uh, again with a width b and a height h, and a height of h, with a centroid here, with a centroid there, and so we looked at two different axes, uh, one which I might call uh, Ix, and then, um, actually maybe I'll call this one Ix, no Ix is fine, and then we looked at another one which is Ix prime, which I might call Ix prime in this context, ix prime, and we found this one was equal to 1 12th bh cubed, or bh cubed over 12, and we found this one was equal to bh cubed over 3. So we saw that no matter what, that the place that we took the uh, axis about, or where we set our axis, very much did matter. And we mentioned that it was important, which we, in the previous discussion, in, uh, previous, in the previous lecture, we discussed that that axis is very important, but we never actually explored how you can convert from one axis to another, or how you can, we simply said they are different, we didn't, we didn't explore exactly how they are different. And that is what the parallel axis theorem is really going to uh, allow us to do. So, and different books will use different, uh, different, uh, variable names. I'm going to use ix and ix prime, but you could use anything you want, or there are different, and I've seen all sorts of different variations, depending on what t uh, textbook you're using, uh, Hibbler, Beer, whatever it may be. So, uh, the parallel axis theorem. The parallel axis theorem Fundamentally, the parallel axis theorem is a way of calculating uh, the moment of inertia, or maybe I should say converting the moment of inertia
calculate it about one axis, about one axis, into the moment of inertia about a parallel axis. A moment of inertia about a parallel axis. And that's kind of the reason it's called the parallel axis theorem. I know uh, we engineers don't name things very creatively. About a parallel axis theorem. So for example here, uh, let's consider a generic rigid body, nice generic potato body, and with a centroid here. Now I'm going to write this out for the IX example, a moment of inertia taken about a horizontal or X axis, but you could use the exact same thing for uh, a Y axis or a really uh, any coordinate system you would choose. You could have a Z, you could do the same thing in the Z. Uh, so if we have this here, let's say we have, um, I'm going to call this uh, X, the X axis, and then I'm going to have some other one a certain distance away, the X prime. And I'm going to say that the X prime axis or the X axis is the axis passing through the centroid. An axis passing through the centroid, or I should actually, you know, I could probably just say a centroidal axis. And X prime is a non centroidal axis. A non centroidal but parallel axis. So as we learned last time, where you take the moment of inertia about, or in other words, what axis you take the moment of inertia about, will result in very different uh, expressions or final values for your moments of inertia. And so, uh, but how? But if we did have one, is there a way to quickly calculate? Uh, is there a way to quickly calculate them or the difference between them? And it turns out there actually is. So I'm going to label a couple other things. First, I want to label a distance d. These are parallel axes, so it wouldn't be too bad to calculate a parallel distance d here, a d. And then I'm going to say that this uh, rigid body, this shape, whatever it is, has an area equal to a. It has an area equal to a. Then uh, I will simply say uh, that ix prime, ix prime, that would be the moment of inertia about the non-centroidal axis is equal to ix, the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis, plus ad squared. This term here, this ad squared, is what allows you to shift from one axis to another. So notice here that this is going to be an addition. And also notice, um, consider this in terms of signs. Area is always going to be positive. And d, whether you looked at it upward or downward, uh, now usually d is just a distance rather than rather than like a displacement factor. But even considering, it, no, even if d was somehow negative, you're going to square it. And so this d squared term is always positive. Area by definition is always positive. So i x prime uh, is always going to be adding something to your i x, which means that so this is this should sort of be a hint here. And I suppose I could write a version of this for i y as well i y prime equals i uh, y sorry I'm getting sidetracked here plus a d squared but you'd have a different distance in the y maybe I could put a dx and a d well I'll just say d right now just just the difference between whatever those axes are um, but what I wanted to mention is back to the idea of adding things if you have a if you're adding something to a number that, that is already positive well the only thing that can happen with this is that this number is going to be smaller so in other words, a conclusion, therefore, ix, the centroidal moment of inertia, is minimum, is the minimum. Of inertia is minimum, is the minimum a body can have. Is the minimum is the minimum moment of inertia a body can have and this uh, connects very deeply with some of the theory we saw last time 
Remember how we said that the moment of inertia represents a shape abil a shape's ability to resist bending? Well, think about this. Um, where is something going to bend? Where is something going to break? Uh, if you think about how uh, physical objects actually work, things always tend to break about their weakest plane or their weakest point. Objects bend, deform, and break. Uh, deform and break about their weakest point. So, this does connect very nicely with what we've seen previously about their weakest point. And so if you have a shape, for example, a rectangle or whatever it might be, the, uh, again, if you take the moment of inertia about the base here, the i, the ix, is uh, bh cubed over 3. But if you take it about the centroid here, that moment of inertia is going to be bh cubed over 12. I guess I could call that ix prime here. ix prime equals bh cubed over uh, 3 and then bh cubed over 12 for the ix. So when I say uh, which which is it going to bend about or where it's going to break, well, uh, imagine if I could make this bend about whatever axis I wanted. Like if I could cause this whole section to bend about this point here, or even some point out here. Well, remember the moment of inertia represents the uh, the, the ability of a shape to resist cr uh, bending, and so it's going to be easier to bend this section about the middle than it. Or and when I say easier, I mean I mean it's going to take less force. It's going to take less moment, it's going to take less energy to bend this about the middle axis here rather than an axis way out here. So that makes sense that that's where bending would occur. Things tend to bend or fail or, or, or expand or twist or any kind of deformation or failure or whatever. Things tend to fail where it's easiest to fail. And so this makes sense. It's going to take the least amount of force to bend this thing right through the centroid. And we can see that because that's where the moment of inertia is minimum. So again, the centroidal axis, this is where um, the i is minimum, where the i, the moment of inertia is minimum, therefore where uh, bending capacity is the least, or bending resistance is the least, and therefore, and you'll see this when you get to mechanics materials, uh, bending, or at least elastic bending, there are, uh, plastic bending is a little bit different, and, and you, you probably don't know what that is yet if you're just uh, taking statics this semester, but that's fine. Um, you can look up the difference or you'll learn about it in mechanics materials, but therefore bending, uh, at least elastic bending, plastic is a little bit different. At least elastic bending occurs about the uh, center, or the centroid. Uh, finally, to, fi to finish up this first part of the lecture, I would like to go and actually develop, well, we've. Uh, I, I would like to prove, maybe not develop, but prove this parallel axis theorem by working through our friendly square example or rectangle example we saw previously. So if this works, I should just be able to take this calculation or this formula and apply the parallel axis theorem to get this one. And the nice thing is, in the previous lecture, I actually developed both of these, so we have a way of uh, checking to make sure I'm not lying to you. So, uh, let's see if I've been lying to you. Well, we have a rectangle here. And we know, or we calculated in the last lecture, that the moment of inertia about the centroid, ix is equal to bh cubed over 12. And I want to find, this, and again, that's about the, that's the centroidal moment of inertia, and then um, this is in a x-axis. This is b, and this is h. And then I want to find an ix prime, but this time instead of by direct integration, I'm going to, fi I'm going to find it by the parallel axis theorem. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. Now, um, I need to get the distance d, and that's not going to be hard. Distance d is just the distance between the two parallel axes. And because this is a distance, actually let's just say b there, or that should say h there instead of b, this distance is h over 2. So, ix prime then, again, assuming I haven't been lying to you, which I suppose you never know, but uh, you can at least go verify this in a book if you don't believe me. <laughs> so, 
I promise I haven't been lying to you all this much. I, I promise I haven't been lying to you all semester, although that would be the worst practical joke ever. Just, uh, can you imagine that? Just going through an entire semester class and find the professor's just been just telling you nonsense the entire semester and everything you learned is wrong, but oh, that's how I got an email from the dean, but uh, okay. So, stupid jokes all around. So, pH cubed <laughs> divided by 12, and then uh, plus the area. And the area is just the area of the shape, and that area is going to be B times H. And then um, times a, a D, and that D is going to be H over 2, quantity squared. H over 2, quantity squared. So we'll have BH cubed over 12, uh, plus, um, that's going to be B H times H squared over 4, uh, which will be BH cubed over 12, and that will come to BH cubed over 4. Oh, not 12 again, but 4. And if I want to put this in the common denominator, so BH cubed over 12 plus uh, 3BH cubed over 12. And that will just be 3 plus uh, 1, or 3 plus 1 is 4BH cubed over 12. And I remember how to simplify fractions, I took algebra, so uh, even pre-algebra in some cases, I guess with variables that would be algebra, um, that would be come to bh cubed over 3. And that is, in fact, exactly what we found previously. So this will be a very useful, so this does show that the parallel axis theorem does work, and it is a very useful way of transforming, uh, it is a very useful way of transforming uh, shapes or, or moments of inertia from one axis to a different but parallel axis. All right, I think that'll do this portion of the lecture. In the next portion, I will show uh, you some other examples. And in particular, I want to work through an example showing how we can apply the parallel axis theorem to calculate the moment of inertia of things made of multiple plates, especially, and those are very common in uh, oh, I beams, wide flange beams, uh, C channels, many of the common shapes we use in civil and mechanical engineering. So that's what we're going to look at next time, calculating the moment of inertia of composite or compound shapes using the parallel axis theorem, very similar to what we looked at when we did uh, the centroids of the composite shapes. All right, so I'll do it for today, uh, or not to do it for today, but do it for now. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, I'll see you soon for uh, part two of lecture 17. And again, let me know if you have any questions. Hope you found this enjoyable. Hope you found this a little bit illuminating. Uh, I'll see you all soon for part, uh, part two of lecture 17. Uh, Tony Laird here signing off, and as always, thank you.